All right, so uh, I've been asked today to talk about the management of metastatic brain tumors and kind of how our paradigm is shifting and how challenging cases may ask us to kind of question the paradigm and incorporate new evidence and research to shift it and change it. So I have no disclosures. Just a brief overview. We're going to talk about a little bit about the background of brain metastases very briefly and then um, talk about the current evidence-based paradigm that we have employed at UCLA regarding the management of brain metastases. Then I'll show a few challenging cases um, regarding uh, some patients that I've treated uh, throughout the years as faculty here, and then um, some of the changes in paradigm that uh, recent research has um, kind of prompted uh, at UCLA. So very briefly, um, metastatic brain tumors are tumors that come from anywhere else in the, the peripheral body that make their way to the brain. Um, in decreasing order of frequency, they most often come from the lung, then the breast, melanoma, renal cell, colorectal, and then uh, tumors of unknown origin. Um, as you can see from the diagram on the right, uh, interestingly, as they most often spread hematogenously in order to get to the brain, as we don't really have a um, lymphatic system there, uh, they have to first go from the periphery to the lung, which sometimes acts as a filter, and then make their way to the brain. If it comes from the lung, it can make their, its way to the brain almost directly and bypass this filter. Um, 20 to 50 percent of patients uh, with cancer develop brain metastases, and with 170,000 cases per year and 100,000 deaths, it's becoming an increasing the larger problem for neurosurgeons, and we're seeing more and more of uh, these patients as uh, the systemic therapies for um, cancers allow these patients to live longer to develop brain mets. The traditional treatment options involve craniotomy and resection, uh, radiation therapy, either in the form of whole brain radiation or stereotactic focused radiation, laser interstitial thermal therapy, or LIT, or laser ablation, Intrathecal chemotherapy, which is essentially the injection of chemotherapy into the cerebral spinal fluid space uh, via an omaya reservoir or lumbar puncture. And then targeted therapies that target specific uh, molecular mutations of tumors and immunotherapy, which harnesses the patient's own immune system, um, allowing it to attack the tumor. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but this is a summary of the UCLA paradigm that we have for the treating brain metastases, and I'll go over it. Um, a little briefly at first and then kind of show you through case examples how uh, we take this in deciding and determining how to treat uh, patients with brain meds. Initially, if a patient presents with a brain metastasis, the first real um, fork in the decision tree is whether or not they have a very, very large number of metastases greater than 15 or leptomeningeal disease. If that's the case, then they may be a better candidate for whole brain radiation. Um, followed by serial imaging to see if any of these tumors um, continue to grow. If they have less than 15 um, brain metastases and are within reason as far as their KPS and functional status to treat, we may consider um, doing surgery plus stereotactic radiosurgery or radiation, uh, focused radiation alone. The big considerations as far as whether or not to do a resection is if there is significant mass effect from the tumor, if they have neurologic deficits from the mass effect of the tumor. If the tumor is easily accessible, it sounds a little weird, but the easier the surgery, the more inclined we may feel to do it. Not only because um, the patient could potentially have a significant benefit once the, the pressure from the tumor is removed, but also as Dr. Everson was saying, allowing the patient to have a good recovery without any functional deficit is um, paramount to long-term survival. And then finally, if there's no clear primary tumor, um, resection allows for uh, determining where this tumor may come from and a pathologic diagnosis. SRS alone is usually if there are poor surgical candidates, if they have many small lesions where a surgery won't give them any functional benefit, um, if they're deep within the, the subcortical white matter, and if there is a known primary. So as far as SRS, um, I'm sorry, surgery, surgical resection and SRS, the data for this comes from um, initially the 1990s with a Patchell's Paramount study where it shows in a randomized trial that they took 48 patients and they found that surgery um, was better for overall survival and functional independence than just biopsy plus whole brain radiation. 
Uh, they followed up this study with a multi-institutional study in 1998 where they demonstrated that surgery followed by whole brain radiation allowed for better overall survival than surgery alone, highlighting the importance of adjuvant radiation to any surgical resection. Chang in 2009 demonstrated that you know if you take these patients with brain metastases and treated them with whole brain radiation and SRS for local tumor control versus just SRS, that the whole brain radiation cohort did significantly worse um, in terms of neurocognition and verbal memory and learning, even at four months out, significantly reducing their functional status and quality of life. Brown in 2017, through a multi-center phase three trial, demonstrated that if you take single brain metastases and resect them, post-operatively, overall survival was similar between the whole brain radiation cohort and the um, stereotactic radiosurgery cohort. You, they also demonstrated that, um, similar to Chang's study, that whole brain radiation was significantly worse than stereotactic focus radiation as far as neurocognitive function, significantly improving the patient's function and quality of life. And then Prabhu in 2017 demonstrated that sure, um, you can do focus radiation to these tumors, but there's still a role for surgery because as tumors grow larger, uh, particularly with brain metastases, the local control of these tumors with focused radiation even becomes poorer and poorer. They found that the um, significant cutoff was about two centimeters, and so tumors that are greater than two centimeters in size, rather than just doing focused radiation, if you perform surgery followed by stereotactic radiation, the overall survival was much better than radiation alone. So it takes us back to this paradigm, and so in the surgical cohort, that's the, the patients that benefit the most from surgery are the ones with the mass effect, the um, larger tumors that would have poor radiation control. But then as far as SRS alone, who do we radiate? How many brain mets is too many brain mets? Yamamoto in 2014 demonstrated that if you have a patient with two to four brain metastases and you treated each one with stereotactic radiosurgery, the overall survival of those patients was similar and comparable to patients with five to ten brain metastases, which allowed people to make the inference that, you know, just because you have ten brain metastases doesn't mean you have to go straight to whole brain radiation. It's not a palliative condition. We can really obtain good local control and overall survival. <clears throat> so just going and discussing a little bit more as far as surgery and um, radiosurgery. So this is a case example of a patient that um, presented about a year out from a primary diagnosis of colorectal carcinoma. And you can see that there is a significant um, contrast enhancing lesion on the patient's left side and the frontal lobe. And there is a significant amount of perilesional edema. Um, there's a significant amount of uh, left to right midline shift with subfalcine uh, herniation. And as Dr. Everson was saying, the, the importance of on-block resection can't be stressed enough, particularly in brain metastases. There have been um, numerous studies that have demonstrated that if you can take a tumor on block, your risk of leaving microscopic disease behind reduces the local control improves, and the risk of spilling tumor cells that can potentially spread into the cerebral spinal fluid space and cause what's called leptomeningeal disease um, is significantly reduced. And I don't know if this video will play. No. Can we go back? Is it possible to go back one slide? Can you? Press uh, play on this video for me by chance. Well, essentially, this is a craniotomy, and, <laughs> and this is about after an hour and a half of work, and the surgeons and the, the audience will have seen, all seen this before, but it's a, our technique is to circumferentially go around the, the tumor by establishing that plane between the tumor and the gliotic uh, white matter, and then we place these cotinoid patties um, in between to maintain that plane and this is a really fun video because the tumor comes out all in one piece. It's a nice little um, video to show and it shows uh, that we were able to achieve a good resection with that. This shows the post-operative scan. This is just some residual blood products but the showed a gross total resection of that enhancing mass and you can already see that the amount of edema and midline shift has improved significantly. <clears throat> but 
in all cases, it's not possible to do this big craniotomy and go through um, the, the cortex, um, particularly in cases with uh, tumors that are a little bit deeper seated within functional cortex. This one particularly was under the, the white matter for sensory motor, and even though it doesn't seem that deep, it was a solitary presumed metastasis in a patient with presumed or with diagnosed uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And this gentleman wanted no functional deficits, and this was um, dominant hemisphere and kind of a sensory motor, uh, motor parietal area. And so we elected for him to do uh, port-based surgery. Um, port-based surgeries have come into vogue recently within the last five, 10 years as kind of a minimally invasive or white matter sparing um, way to access these lesions. Um, and what it allows for us to do is take these retractors that can be guided by DTI guidance and brain lab navigation in order to splay a sulcus aside or through the sulcus splay the gyri aside, um, thereby somewhat preserving the white matter as best as possible, rather than going through the gyrus as we typically do, um, thereby destroying the overlying cortex. This is kind of an image of what it looks like, um, and this kind of tip right here is what we use um, in order to help splay open a gyrus, and this is the, the brain lab probe that's inserted to the tip um, so you can navigate your trajectory. Is it any way to play this video? Can you move the mouse around? No? Or maybe we can just open the video. But essentially, this is an example of a, a brain path um, surgery. This craniotomy, you can see this is two centimeters from here to here. The craniotomy itself was only like three and a half, four centimeters. We navigated to this um, kind of sulcus with this very prominent vein. And the, the beginning of the video it demonstrates that we uh, are opening the arachnoid here over this vein in order to open up this sulcus. It was a great resection. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, the, the, the cool thing about this technique is because you're working through a port the whole time, the, the amount of brain retraction and the, the injury to the, the, the vein, you can see that the vein is still there. Um, is, it's, it's spared throughout the whole case. The surgical corridor is really through this sulcus and then you can see that the tumor has been removed in its entirety. And that was the immediate post-operative scan. And this is the scan that was done three months out. And you can see that the corridor that's been followed down there is almost completely um, collapsed at that point with just the cavity where the tumor was and the patient um, had no post operative deficits it's left the hospital post-operative day one um, and did very well from that. <clears throat> so that's surgery and SRS. But then the question is, you know, is it always surgery and SRS or always surgery followed by whole brain radiation or uh, focused radiation? And <clears throat> this is a representative example of another patient that presented with a cystic brain metastasis. Um, it, it was measured about three and a half, four centimeters in size. It's pushing on the precentral gyrus or the motor cortex, displacing the fibers posterior, posteriorly, causing a lot of perilesional edema. We took this patient to surgery as he had significant neurologic deficit, and this was a solitary brain metastasis. Um, but post-operative, you can see, even though it was a very good resection, you have this very ill-defined post uh, um, resection cavity, and now the, the challenge is for uh, myself and the radiation oncologist to go back and contour this resection cavity so that we can treat any residual tumor that might have been left behind. This is an example of the radiation plan, and you can see that we created this field. The PTV includes um, a two millimeter margin, so we were essentially radiating two millimeters, a presumed normal but possibly tumor infiltrated brain. Um, which increases our risk of radiation necrosis, but this is necessary given the movement of the cavity, um, <clears throat> as well as our margin of error with uh, stereotactic radiation planning. And so there's been a recent movement as well to do, perform neoadjuvant radiation, which is radiation prior to a resective surgery. Um, numerous studies have come out, but one of the better ones is done by Patel in 2016 um, at the Emory Group. And they found that if you radiate the tumor or the brain metastasis prior to actually performing a definitive resection, your risk of spreading the tumor into the CSS space um, or causing leptomeningeal disease which has a prognosis, a median prognosis and overall survival of four to six months. So you're taking a very treatable um, brain metastasis and almost turning it into a non-treatable disease. 
that risk reduces from 16% to 3.2%. The risk of radiation necrosis or radiation damage from treating a very fine, defined um, brain tumor, it's very circular on all these MRIs, to an ill-defined resection cavity, the risk of radiation necrosis um, is reduced from 16% to 4.9%. The overall survival and the local and distant recurrence is similar between these groups. Um, so this idea of neoadjuvant radiosurgery has caught on and is um, acquiring a lot of um, interest. And uh, we've been approved for a clinical trial at UCLA and we'll be enrolling soon. Just a little plug for that. <coughs> So this is a, a challenging patient with a, a known history of melanoma, which was excised completely from the skin about nine months ago, or nine months prior to this presentation. They said it was in situ, no evidence of distant metastases, however, presents to our ER with this very large intraventricular lesion um, causing hydrocephalus and um, neurocognitive deficits. So this patient, if we went in there with a presumed melanoma and took this out piecemeal, because you can't take a four centimeter tumor out, out on block with this connection to the basal ganglia, um, most likely, or almost definitively, you would have leptomeningeal spread and have a prognosis of four to six months. So we advocated for neoadjuvant radiation and craniotomy through an interhemispheric approach um, and a transcolossal in order to remove this tumor and limit the risk of leptomeningeal disease. This is the postoperative MRI, which demonstrates good resection of the tumor. And this is the six-month postoperative MRI. This is actually a non-enhancing scar tissue, actually intrinsic blood from the, the melanoma tumor. So no recurrence of this disease. And now this patient is about uh, 16 months out. Uh, she did have uh, one local or distant recurrence that was treated with stereotactic radiosurgery, and she's doing well. So. Uh, we talked briefly about those things, but what happens when we have treatment failure? So at those points, if a MET escapes resection and radiation, we talk about laser interstitial ther thermal therapy. Um, in these cases, we have brain tumors or brain metastases that fail radiation, so we can't go back with stereotactic radiosurgery. And by inserting a stereotactic fiber and performing real-time thermal uh, or MR thermography, um, to ablate these lesions in the MR suite, we can achieve 60 to 100 percent control rate um, across multi-institution um, studies. Um, it's minimally invasive in regards to incision, but it can have significant perilesional edema around the ablative zone for days to weeks, but this can typically be treated with steroids. So this is a challenging patient, a uh, 60-ish year old female with metastatic lung. Uh, she already had one tumor that escaped radiation, so we ablated it with laser ablation, but then she had progressive radiation necrosis in the occipital lobe, as well as a deep cerebellar excuse me, cerebellar lesion that seemed to be taking off as well. Now there's always a question, is this recurrent tumor or is this radiation necrosis? You don't know until you get in there. We do know though that if we let these continue to grow on serial imaging, they will um, progressively cause neurologic deficits and this lady was having a progressive uh, field cut related to the occipital lesion. Given that this one was so superficial, though, we elected to do a craniotomy for this. We first inserted this um, laser fiber into the cerebellar lesion as it was deeper and a little bit more of a morbid surgery to do a PFOSA surgery. So a laser fiber was inserted first so we didn't lose our stereotaxy, followed by a very quick craniotomy and resection of this tumor. This is a, a different case, but shows an example of uh, the varioguide insertion of the, the laser fiber. Um, this is an uh, initial biopsy needle with a uh, brain lamp guided biopsy. This is the bone anchor. This is the laser fiber being inserted after the biopsy is performed. Um, this is us in the, this is Dr. Solomon, our neuroradiologist, the patient in the MR suite where she will then have us do an ablation. This is Dr. Yang's case and we are doing real-time thermography um, with safe zones delineating where um, the uh, heat maps are. This is back to the, that original patient that I was discussing. This shows a gross total resection of the occipital lesion. This is the laser fiber that's being inserted into the cerebellum right there. Because of the keel, the uh, keel of the, the suboccipit, the laser fiber deflected a little bit and was just off to midline to the side, but um, 
Luckily, the way that uh, thermal energy goes down the laser, it preferentially follows the, the lesion, um, either tumor or radiation necrosis, and you can see that it's following these areas. We marked safe zones, so you can see this five and the four in purple, so that if it went too medially, it would cut off so we don't affect the dentate nuclei. And then following the ablation, you can see a good ablation of the radiation necrosis here. The, the, Sub I'm sorry, gross total resection of the radiation necrosis here. And then finally, I just want to talk a little bit about leptomeningeal disease. I hinted on it a little bit earlier as far as it being kind of uh, the end game as far as uh, brain metastases go. And this, I think, is a big problem. Uh, and I think the best way to treat leptomeningeal disease is to prevent leptomeningeal disease, and hence the neoadjuvant radiation, on block resections, patient selection. Um, LMD or leptomeningeal disease is dissemination of tumor cells into the CSF space. Happens a lot in lung cancer, can happen in breast cancer and melanoma. And the prognosis is still very poor. Um, treatment options include whole brain radiation, um, but some groups have tried craniospinal radiation, but this can be very, very toxic with significant paresthesias, nausea and vomiting. And then intrathecal chemotherapy has been used as far as methotrexate and cytarabine, but this has been um, very mixed as far as the outcomes and really hasn't changed it actually. Um, and then targeted immunotherapy and immunotherapies which show some promise. This is a patient that presented with a solitary brain metastasis, uh, known history of lung can or sorry, breast cancer three years ago. And this looks like, hey, this comes to the surface, it's behind sensory motor, it should be easily resectable, we can give this patient a good outcome. But if you look very carefully, you notice that there's a little bit of enhancement going into the sul sulcus right here. And so even though we were able to achieve a gross total resection, and this is just um, intrinsic T1 hyperintensity consistent with postoperative blood products, on the immediate um, one month scan for radiation planning, you can see already there's enhancement going back into that sulcus right there and a little bit of um, subdural and um, enhancement right there consistent with leptomeningeal disease. We performed a focused radiation including this in our field, um, but unfortunately at her um, two to three month scan, she had very significant amount of LMD and you can see that it's all caking this all side within the cerebellar folia as well as the bilateral temporal lobes and vermis and interbrinocular cistern. Um, so this patient did not do that great. So we try intrathecal chemotherapy, deliver CSF into this, um, uh, sorry, deliver chemotherapy into the CSF space, but like I said, evidence remained mixed. So what next? Targeted therapies, including um, targeting certain hormones, um, such as HER2 new, progesterone and breast cancer, EGFR inhibitors, MEK and BRAF inhibitors in melanoma, ALK inhibitors in non-small cell lung cancer. But judicious use is key because not all of them penetrate the blood-brain barrier. Um, only five, per, five to ten percent of the first generation ones do, so they may not um, work well in the brain if they, even though they work well systemically. Molecular profiles may change by the time they get to the brain, and so um, we should really select which patients we use these for. And then finally, immunotherapy. The mechanism um, is we enhance the immune-mediated anti-tumor response either by um, CTLA-4 or PD-1 or PDL one on tumor receptors. And by blocking these immune inhibitory interactions, the immune system can recognize these tumor cells more readily and kill them. And this is just a summary slide of many of the trials and immune checkpoint inhibitors that are being used to target this slew of cancers. And with that, I will end. Thanks.